Jonathan Brunt. I'm the government editor of the Spokesman Review. We're here today with Senator Manka Dingra, who's running for attorney general as a Democrat in the August 6th primary election. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And with us to help with the questions is Spokesman Review reporter in Olympia, Ellen Dennis. So, um, uh, first of all, I, I just want to let you uh, have your make your pitch. Why are you the best candidate among the three on the ballot for attorney general? Thank you so much. Um, as you know, my name is Manka Dingra. I'm the deputy majority leader of the Washington State Senate. I chair the Law and Justice Committee. I sit on the Health Care Committee and Ways and Means, and I am running to be the next attorney general. I have spent my entire career fighting for the people of Washington in the courtroom as a senior uh, deputy prosecuting attorney and in the sen state Senate. Standing up for survivors of violence, immigrants, women, LGBTQI individuals. And as a King County prosecutor, I worked on domestic violence, sexual assault, and trafficking cases, gun cases, hate crimes. I then ended up creating the first in the nation therapeutic alternative unit at the prosecutor's office, where uh, we were the second in the country to start a mental health court. I helped create our veterans court, our diversion programs and helped develop the 40-hour crisis intervention training at the Criminal Justice Training Commission, where I trained law enforcement for 10 years uh, before stepping down to run for office. I am running for attorney general to protect the people of Washington, no matter what you look like, how you identify, or where you come from. And I have both the political and the legal background to be effective and efficient at this job. Over the last seven years, I'm really proud to have played a central role in delivering so many of the major wins for the state of Washington as a senator. I have worked on and delivered on legislation protecting our voting rights, protecting and expanding access to reproductive rights, gender-affirming care, including sponsoring the nation's strongest data privacy laws, protecting our environment, protecting workers' safety, and expanding critical mental health access. And it is this fight for justice, for standing up for people and delivering real change to improve people's lives. This is what motivates me to be the next attorney general. I wanna, uh, first off, uh, ask you, uh, one of your, you have one Democratic opponent among the three. Um, so I uh, wonder for the Democratic leaning folks out there, why do you feel you're the best candidate specifically thinking about the choices of among Democrats. Thank you. You know, that is what people want to know. And I'll start off by saying is I have a long track record of actually fighting for tough issues and delivering results. I have done that over and over again for the last seven years. And we know that the attorney general's position is an elected position, not an appointed position. So you have to have someone who has that political expertise and legal expertise. And that is what I bring to this job. And I'll give you, you know, one example. This last session was a short session. And most people have two or three bills that they work on and pass. I had 12 bills, um, really meaty bills about sexual assault, trafficking, a gun bill, and you know, mental health bill. 100% of these bills, all 12 of them, were passed with bipartisan support, including my gun bill. And so that is that expertise that I bring to this office because we know the attorney general's office is both a political and legal uh, position. And my track record of working on tough issues and delivering results is what differentiates both of us. All right. Um, Ellen, uh, would you like to ask a question now? Yeah. Um, I know there has been some discussion of transparency in the attorney general's office on um, this election cycle. If elected, where are some or what are some things you'd like to address those concerns that have been brought about by kind of the journalists and the public alike? You know, I have spent my entire career being subject to the public disclosure requests uh, as a senior deputy prosecuting attorney and then even as a state senator. And I fundamentally believe 
that government works best when people understand what is happening and what individuals are doing. So I think transparency is key. Uh, I think most of the time when people fully understand what is happening, they end up being a lot more supportive of decisions that are made and processes that are followed than when they aren't. So I've always been committed on making sure that whatever we do, we are being transparent and accountable to the people that we serve. Okay. Um, there's been also a lot of discussion about shortages in prosecuting offices and for public defenders. And I'm curious what you would do if elected to address those concerns across the state. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned that up because when people talk about uh, crime and they talk about holding people accountable, one of the biggest issues our state is facing is actually a shortage of prosecutors, defense, and judges. And that is really creating a huge backlog for our legal system. This is where I think my relationship with the legislature um, is going to come in extremely handy. The vast majority of them have endorsed me for my race to be the next attorney general. And I think it is imperative that our next attorney general actually come from the legislature so they understand what it means to uh, pass budgets and bills and work with our legislators so that we're all rowing in the same direction. You know, we have to take a look at creating more incentives for people to come into the public sector. We are seeing this across the board. Um, so I will absolutely be an advocate in making sure I'm working with the legislature to see how we can incentivize individuals coming into the field. I also think we have to take a look at pay uh, compensation a pay scale and really take a look at other non-monetary incentives we can provide individuals for doing this work because our government will really um, be hindered if we cannot attract good people to do this work. Um, we talked a little bit about what you, how you differentiate yourself from other candidates, but um, there will be a new attorney general for the first time in 12 years. How would you change the office if you were elected? You know, I actually started my legal career at the Attorney General's office. When I was in law school, I actually was an intern working in the Sexually Violent Predator Unit of the Criminal Division. And so, you know, I have, um, I go way back with the AG's office. And I think there are always things one can do to improve. Uh, Bob Ferguson has been a fantastic Attorney General. Uh, I am very focused in making sure that we are we are taking a look at problems and addressing them before they become huge. I definitely have a problem solving mentality where we bring people together to solve tough problems. And so I always make sure that that's where we are starting off. Um, I am a litigator, I'm not afraid to take anyone to trial, but I think many times we can do a better job in uh, making sure we're resolving issues before they become huge. So this is where working with our agencies, working with the next governor, working with the legislature to make sure we stay ahead of problems. I'm extremely concerned that the True Blood lawsuit, this is the one where the state continues to be fined because they people are spending lots of months in jail before being transferred to our state hospitals. That lawsuit has been going on for about a decade, and we have to bring closure to that and other such lawsuits. So I am absolutely committed in making sure that we are frankly doing a lot of housekeeping when it comes to dealing with our agencies and the manner in which they're showing up to help the people of Washingtonians. I will say like Attorney General Bob Ferguson, I will be making sure that we are leading the charge against protecting the rights of all Washingtonians, regardless of what comes down at us from our US Supreme Court or if uh, Trump comes back into the White House. So are you supportive of all the, the lawsuits that have happened originating from Attorney General Ferguson, uh, especially when Trump was president? Absolutely. You know, we have to make sure we have individuals fighting to uh, ensure we have access to reproductive rights, gender affirming care. We have to make sure that we're protecting our environment, worker safety, immigrants, uh, women, LGBTQI individuals. And I'm going to be a fierce fighter when it comes to making sure that none of our rights are rolled back. And this includes access to voting rights. Uh, there's a long list of issues that there's great concern that at the federal level that we are losing those rights. And frankly, in Washington, under my watch, we will make sure that none of those rollbacks impact Washingtonians. Okay, Ellen? Well, 
When you talk about um, kind of incentivizing public sector employees, um, both public defenders and prosecutors through increased wages, um, and some of the other issues you've talked about in the office, where would you look to source the funding for those things? Because both of those are pretty costly. You know, this is where the relationship with the legislature comes in, where we really have to make sure that we lead, we are speaking with our legislators on the problems they see and being a partner in ensuring we are doing things together. Um, they are very aware of the shortages as well. We are seeing a lot of backlogs in our court cases. We've been hearing from prosecutors and defense attorneys all across the state that this is a huge problem. And, um, you know, and this is where, again, there are lawsuits that are going to continue to be filed to address this because it is a um, civil rights issue for so many in the criminal uh, arena. Uh, we even have the civil arena we need to be talking about. So I think this is where, again, that uh, relationship with the legislature is key because it will take funding to ensure that we can be fully staffed. Um, there's been a, a lots of uh, work in the legislature on police reform. Uh, you know, after 2020, uh, going into 2021, and then some of that was has been rolled back since. Um, what's your position about uh, some of the things the legislature did and then rolled back, such as uh, some of the rules for uh, pursuing people in a vehicle? Why don't you start with that one, and you can talk about some of the other ones. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I'll say on the uh, vehicle pursuit um, issue, we really have to make sure that we as a state are being data driven and evidence based. So the policy that was started in the House that came to the Senate that I voted for uh, was the policy of the district that I represent. So that was an easy vote for me because that is what the policy of my district was. The following year, we had heard that uh, there were some concerns. So I had actually helped uh, amend that law to allow for more flexibility. And then the initiative was passed. But I fundamentally believe that in order to have a, um, a pursuit policy, we actually need to have a work group through the Criminal Justice Training Commission, where we actually have experts in the area who are doing the work and the community coming together to develop a pursuit policy that makes sense. Because what works for downtown Kirkland at three in the afternoon is not what is going to work in Yakima at three in the afternoon. And so I think we really need to have a nuanced look at uh, what it needs to look like and what are the parameters around it. And I think those kinds of things are best done um, with experts through the Criminal Justice Training Commission rather than in the legislature. In terms of other um, police accountability uh, laws, I've actually been very proud to lead so much of the work there. I had a bill on making sure we have a duty to intervene and a duty to report, really making sure that our good officers are empowered to um, hold the ones that may not be doing the right things accountable. We also made sure that since we have a certification process for law enforcement, that there also is a decertification uh, process so that, again, the bad actors can be held accountable and that we're changing the culture of policing. And this is something that Sue Rahr had started at the Criminal Justice Training Commission when I started training law enforcement. And that was really changing the culture to needing and wanting guardians on our street rather than warriors in our street. And that is the work that I'm committed in continuing to do, is ensuring our officers get the training that they need, that they're empowered to do the right thing, and that we are holding bad actors accountable. I wonder, uh, one of the um, reforms that has not been rolled back is a requirement that if minors are arrested, that they must be, uh, the attorney must be present. Uh, it's not just a matter of a, um, Miranda writes, but it, the attorney must be there. Um, how do you feel about that reform? You know, I've heard mixed feelings about that one. Um, I've heard from officers that uh, they don't think it's working and others haven't really talked about it much. I think we really need to make sure that we are understanding exactly what is happening uh, at that level. We have to make sure that the rights of our children are protected. I will say that when that bill uh, came to the Senate, I had actually put in some kind of exceptions around trafficking victims 
because I really wanted to make sure when dealing with survivors of trafficking and engagement with law enforcement that they have the capacity to actually provide them the resources and the help that they need because we know that the power dynamic between a trafficker um, and the survivor uh, or the victim can be extremely concerning. And so I have heard that that exception in that bill is working well. So I think we really need to uh, get more concrete information on exactly what is happening. I have been hearing from some law enforcement officers that it's been very hard to get a hold of defense attorneys. So I think I'm glad we're having the conversation, but I think we absolutely need to get more information to really figure out what is working, what's not, and how we can tweak it. But we have to make sure we are uh, protecting the rights of our youth, but also making sure that we are, again, holding the bad actors accountable. Helen. Um, yeah, with the kind of growth of technology and some looks to artificial intelligence um, and just more surveillance and policing, a lot of law enforcement agencies across the state, state particularly in more urban places, are looking toward increased surveillance and AI um, to help monitor crime and traffic violations. Um, with that comes a lot of privacy concerns and worries about maybe racial profiling and who's handling the data, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts on that and those discussions surrounding um, cameras and AI and policing? And what are um, kind of things you would do to um, make sure people's uh, like concerns are addressed if you're elected? You know, this is, I love having these conversations about emerging technologies. Um, you know, I'm the only one that's been able to pass a data privacy bill in the state of Washington. It was Rep Slatter and I who passed My Health, My Data. And so I'm actually uh, extremely eager as the next attorney general to really make sure that Washington is leading the nation when it comes to protection of personal identifying information, cybersecurity, fraud issues. I also think that technology does have a role to play in policing. Um, I think they you have to take a look at balance on how it's used, uh, what is done with the information, retention, and um, and and uh, inferences that are made from the images that are taken. But I do believe that there's a role of uh, for technology in policing. I was a big supporter of the GPS uh, dark guns. Uh, I think that is a very good technology to use uh, when you're pursuing vehicles. I I'm supportive of drones that are used uh, in order to pursue vehicles um, instead of a, a car on a street. Um, I think there's a role uh, for um, for uh, license plate readers. So I think we have to be careful as we move forward. I think we have to put um, parameters around storage, retention, and additional use. But I do think that there is a role for technology to play in policing. I think it can be a great enabler but we also have to make sure we're being cautious on the negative consequences. The Attorney General, um, Attorney General Ferguson has uh, lobbied the legislature for uh, gun restrictions over the years and had had some success there. W are there um, certain gun laws that you would propose and lobby the legislature to pass? You know, I have actually worked on uh, gun laws every single year that I've been in the legislature. I have sponsored and passed so many of the bills that um, actually help survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, um, that help individuals who have been found to be uh, a danger to themselves or others. And the work that I think the Attorney General's Office needs to do next is actually be a resource for our entire state in order to ensure that when someone is found ineligible to possess a firearm, that someone is actually going in and ensuring that surrender of firearm happens. In King County, they're doing that, but I know this is not happening all across the state. And the prosecutors and law enforcement that I have spoken to, they say they don't do the surrender of firearm because they don't have resources. So I wanna make sure as attorney general, we actually have individuals who are focused on helping um, law enforcement statewide enforce so many of the laws that we have passed in the legislature. We were the only state to actually see a reduction in suicide uh, through firearms uh, after COVID. And that has a lot to do with the legislations we have passed in removing uh, access to guns from individuals who are a danger to themselves or others. So um, I think we have to be smart on how we are dealing with this problem. But the first is making sure we are enforcing the laws that have been passed. 
I was also proud to have been the prime sponsor of the bill that created the first statewide firearm safety and violence prevention office in the country. And so it's not just about reacting to gun violence, but it's also making sure that we're collecting data and taking a look at communities where gun violence is uh, pervasive and making sure that we have a plan on how to do um, early intervention and uh, provide resources so that gun violence doesn't continue. And what we have found uh, when you take a look at public health approach towards gun violence, that is very similar to cigarette smoking. So in families and communities where you see a lot of cigarette smoke, the next generation is more likely to smoke as well. And that seems to be true for gun violence as well. When you have individuals who live in families or communities where there is high rates of um, gun violence, they're more likely to either be a victim or a perpetrator of gun violence. So I think as AG, we also have to do a lot of data collection and taking a look at where violence is occurring and then making sure that we are engaging with the community, with um, evidence-based practices and the legislature in trying to prevent future gun violence. Are you thinking the Attorney General's office would actually have some type of higher personnel or something to help with count communities that haven't been able to, excuse me, confiscate you know, uh, weapons that are supposed to be confiscated? Um, yes, I think there is the ability of the Attorney General's office to help in that regard. Um, the AG's office in the criminal division actually does act as a resource for other law enforcement and um, prosecuting attorney's office, the work that they do with the sexual assault forensic examination task force, the work that they've done with the sexually violent predator unit. And so what I'm proposing is something similar to that, where if um, agencies and um, prosecuting attorney's offices need support and resources in order to do the surrender of firearms, I absolutely want to make sure that the AG's office is a resource to help in that, just like they do uh, with um, with cold case units, with sexual assault forensic examination task force, and the sexually violent predator unit. All right, Ellen. What can the state attorney general do to address our state's opioid crisis and specifically fentanyl in the streets right now? You know, um, unfortunately, it is the local law enforcement and the local prosecutors that do a lot of the enforcement in terms of users and individuals who are engaging in the trade of delivering drugs. This is, again, I think where an attorney general's office can be a resource if they want to do interjurisdictional task forces, really make sure that we are using our resources to help with more complex cases, being the entity that uh, brings people together in order to have these tough of conversations or take a look at cross-border issues. But frankly, it's gonna take the U.S. Attorney's Office to take a look at how drugs are coming into the state and making sure that we are collaborating with all the different local jurisdictions. But the AG's office does not really have a direct oversight over um, the individuals who are using or delivering drugs, that is the local prosecutors. But I think for cross-jurisdictional issues and complex cases, absolutely making sure I will be a resource um, in having those conversations and convening those work groups. The other role that the AG's office can play actually is in civil commitment. Uh, the Attorney General's office uh, does represent uh, DSHS, which um, has the state hospitals. And we know that when individuals are civilly committed as being a danger to themselves or others or needing treatment, I think that is where the AG's office can, again, make sure that they are working on addressing the competency and restoration process, but also the civil commitment process. This is where I think having a, a statewide leader who has a background in mental health is critical because we have to make sure that that entire process of access to mental health and substance use disorder is unclogged, which means making sure people who are being committed to our hospitals actually have access to go to inpatient treatment or outpatient treatment, and that even access to our state hospital is actually um, something that is an option. Because right now, given the length of uh, delays in getting in, it really is frankly not an option. We just opened the UW Teaching Hospital where they have beds for inpatient treatment. And it is the assistant attorney generals who will be making sure that they are the ones representing uh, UW in the civil commitment hearings. So there's a lot, a uh, big role for the AG to play in terms of civil commitment when it comes to substance use disorder and mental health. With the um, 
Speaking of, uh, you know, fentanyl and, and drug crimes, a uh, big issue in the last few years has been the decriminalization of drug possession. Um, the legislature, after a court case, rolled back the penalties, has since upped them up a little bit. What's your take on, on, on that? You know, if we lived in an ideal situation, we will want um, drug substance use disorder to be a public health issue. Uh, but there are the practicalities and the ideal, which don't go hand in hand. So I think what you have to do where we currently are is making sure that we provide treatment at every single stage of uh, the process. So if you start from one extreme to taking a look at people in prison, making sure they're getting an assessment and making sure they go through treatment. So by the time they are released, they are in recovery. Same thing at our jails, then making sure we are providing resources for our therapeutic courts, making sure we're doing diversion programs, uh, making sure we have options for treatment prior to engagement with the criminal justice system, making sure civil commitment uh, statutes are ramped up, and then doing early intervention and prevention. So you have to take a look at the entire spectrum and make sure you have options for treatment every single step of the way. The hope really is that we as a society come to a stage where we are able to provide resources so that the uh, substance use disorder can be handled mm -hmm. as a uh, public health issue. But unfortunately, we are not there yet. So you were supportive of bringing it back to the level it was at? Or, or where um, it's at currently? You know, I think practically that is what we have to do, absolutely. Okay. We do not have the infrastructure to do anything different. Ellen, do you have a, uh, a last question? Yeah. Um, what message would you like young voters in the state to get from your campaign? You know, a message of hope. I am someone who ran for office in 2017 to challenge the status quo because I fundamentally believe that we need leaders who are bold and lead with their values and don't do what is politically convenient. And that is what I have done for the last seven years. And that is what I'm planning on doing as the next attorney general. I will say I do have a youth campaign committee where we have engaged over 70 youth. And I'm really proud of the youth energy we have uh, behind this campaign. And so I'll just say to all the youth out there, there is hope. And we have people who are willing to stand up and challenge the status quo. All right. Uh is there any other big issue that you feel like you, you know, initiative you want to bring to the office or something that you want to touch on? You know, I think we have to make sure that we have leaders who are addressing healthcare access. And as the only candidate in this race who has a background in healthcare, having spent the last six years working on healthcare in the Senate, we have to make sure that we are taking care uh, of people across the state. And I'm talking about reproductive rights, uh, gender affirming care, end of life. And I'm also talking about basic uh, access to healthcare from the top of our heads down to the toes. And I think this is where the next attorney general must make sure that they are taking a look at mergers and acquisitions across the entire healthcare spectrum, because we have healthcare deserts in the state of Washington. And this is something that people need from the day they're born to the last days on this planet. And so I uh, want to make sure that as the next attorney general, we are taking a look at access to healthcare for everyone. Senator Dingra, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you.